Oh, I'm not quick with it, but I'm quick with it. And if you want to get with it, you can get anal fisted. Welcome to episode 49 of the Off and Beat podcast. I'm your host, Clint, and I'm sure you didn't see that coming, but you know what they say when you throw hands, you throw bands, you let it throw it back until uh, God says she can. That's how you find out things about people these days. You uh, let them throw it back, and you just sit there. And if you let people do or talk enough, they will show you everything they are. You know, I, I heard this quote one time. I'm pretty sure it was from, um, pretty sure it was from a renowned figure in history. Maybe it was like. Maybe it was like Gandhi or something. It said, never listen to the first word someone speaks. And also never listen to the last. Because the last word is the realization. The first word is a feel out to see how much realization stands. Listen to 70% of the way through. Because when people are 50% of the way through, they don't. Notice it yet. They think it's all good. They have the realization of the self-awareness at 70%-ish. And once you get the 70%, ignore the rest. Because you've gotten all the information you needed to know. And uh, speaking of information you need to know, did you know that if you pluck a daisy and stick it up your nose, you won't sneeze? Even though typically dandelions and little... uh. You know, in the springles, grass, typically they make you sneeze. Allergies, hence why allergy medication is going through the roof. Like, uh, this is how we do it. Sneezing on your pussy. Um, But, yeah, if you stick the stems up your nose, it will actually prevent. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a vaccine for the nose. And... It's like just literally coming from the source. No matter how much the sun will light, you always have to be the sun and go light on the liquor because maybe your uh, dad's alcoholic. So you do the opposite of what you've seen. And if you always just do the opposite of what your parents do, you're probably in good shape. And then there's some people that may take it to the complete opposite. And they do the opposite of what their parents do, and uh, they probably should have done the exact same thing. And the reality is, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. You take the great qualities from your parents, learn from the bad qualities, and you try to, you know, lessen the deficit. Life is nothing but a big old margin. And I'm, talk- and I'm not talking about the margarine you uh, spread in between your cheeks before you... Uh, Open the muffin top back there and call it an easy bake oven. This ain't for the kids. I'm talking about the margins that are the difference between you being a stable, normal human being that knows how to deal with life. And being the difference between that and being complete delusional that literally listens they, when they listen to or watch videos or they listen to things, they're not even looking to just be entertained. They're looking to reconfirm a thought process that they have. But it's almost like they can't just go into the world with these thought processes they have and actually test them out themselves. They need someone to regurgitate it back to them. And these are typically people who aren't critical thinkers, who don't think for themselves. The ironic part of all these um channels that you may follow like the fresh and fit and i'm not going to really talk about fresh and fit but it's a great example that typically people that are just clan followers of these where the i'm a loyal person here's the thing with loyalty loyalty still has strings there's still a certain amount of gratitude there's still a certain amount of expectation i have for if i'm being loyal to you there's an expectation that you still do right by me, or at least do right in consideration for others. And the issue is sometimes when you get these followings that typically are 
extreme followings type of thing. And it's just for someone to have something to be a part of and to have something to justify maybe shortcomings in their life. And if you're getting an explanation that it's not your fault why you are the way you are, it's the way people think and you either adjust to it or you die, which honestly, it's not a crazy message. It's, it's survival. You do have to learn to adapt to your environment or you die. Um, you have to adapt and make money or you don't eat. And if you don't eat, you die. You can't survive, you die. So that's a great message. But when it becomes as blind loyalty, I don't care. I, I really think uh, when you get into family, quote unquote, loyalty, you got to be really careful. I'm fortunate enough where I don't have these problems, but a lot of people will blindly support their family no matter what. And sometimes that it takes the common sense ability out of you. You think because you're tied loyalty and no matter what you support those who you care about and close to you, that no matter what you stick by them and you support them. And that's when you have people that stay with people that abuse them because they put a ring on it and you're loyal no matter what and loyalty sometimes creates the avenue and it creates an opening for people to act terribly and act like pieces of shit and know they could take advantage of that and you stay so really loyalty can actually really make you a very weak person when you really think about it it takes a lot of strength to be loyal but also it can be an excuse to justify your weakness because you're not assessing something for what it is anymore with a real point of view you're you have this idea of just sticking with it no matter what that this person oh we made a commitment no matter what it's like no matter what and that's when you get parents that blame their kids that their dad raped them or molested them and you get or you have a sibling that gets, you find out they get, they're basically a prototype of Jared from Subway. It'd be the equivalent if you're, if you love Subway sandwiches, if you love Subway sandwiches, you ate there every day, you're a loyal customer. And then when all the Jared Fogle child porn thing came out and you're like, I know, but you know what? I'm a big, you know, me and Subway have this tight relationship They've been through me. They've been with me through jobs. They've been with me through the hard times of my life. They've been affordable. They've been there. So you know what? I'm going to give Jared the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying you got to stop being at Subway. No, that's idiotic. Because if they do the right things, fire him, get rid of him. He's not a face of our product anymore. It went years to rebuild their image, by the way. like Because he was like literally the face of Subway. And imagine that people just like, yeah, we just kind of forget about that. And that's really just good on their part for marketing and doing all the things to just get his image out of people's head. Because you imagine if you were just because you felt you were a loyal member of the subway, you're like, you know what? I'm going to support Jared no matter what. Yeah, uh, actually, we see he has a DVD tape of uh, your child being in child porn. I, but you know what? I am loyal to the people that make my sandwiches. And you know what? He's part of my family externally. So no matter what, I'm going to support Jared blindly. It's like, nah, there's pretty clear evidence. There's like hundreds and hundreds of videos on his hard drive. Um, it's like, yeah, but you know what? We don't know all. You know, we don't know what made him like that. It's like, all right, look, he's a fucking child predator. I don't care your association with him. He's a fucking face of a sandwich company. I don't care if you eat there every fucking day. I don't care if you eat there five times a day. I don't care if you love that you work there. I don't care if you work there, you're committed to the company, and you're going to be out here putting a Jared flag like he's Trump and show your support. It's funny how we just show blinds. So we'll just put flags up of random things we support, and then... We feel like when people put flags out of things that aren't quote unquote the American flag and they're custom made flags of things that are very specific, honoring people that aren't like personal family members that died in war, but just a fucking Trump. 
it's weird that we have these weird things that we idolize and put flags of people and stuff just to show our support when the only reason why you're putting this flag out on your yard or on your porch is simply because you just want to prove everyone, yeah, look at me, fuck you. Do you imagine if someone put a Jared from Subway during all that time when that was coming out and we support Jared? Yeah, that is not a gallery you want to be a part of. Um, is but the sad reality of it is is it's it's a microcosm of this blind loyalty that I feel people have. This is just a personal opinion on loyalty. I think loyalty is a very it's a very necessary aspect you have to be able to have of yourself. Because then it's just an excuse to not be loyal to things. And it's an excuse to not be committed to things. And not have a empathetic heart or an actual like... To have a bonding relationship with someone in any capacity. And sometimes you need to have the idea of loyalty to hold yourself grounded. And to remind yourself of what this person means to you type of thing. But when all... But when there's so much clear evidence and you're completely blind, you should be, a loyalty should be type of thing where they display consistent behavior that deserves your loyalty. The the, the irony about loyalty, people think being loyal to piece of shit people is a good quality. And I don't. They think being someone through thick and thin, it's like, you know what? If someone constantly puts you in really bad positions, that person is not very loyal to you, in my opinion. It's quite the opposite. They could give a shit about your loyalty that they think no matter what they do, you should stick by them and you will. It's like if someone go like to me, if a father puts himself in a position that he knows he will go to that, he will probably go to prison for. And he makes a choice to stay in that situation and put his kid at risk of not having a father growing up. Or his family to not have a consistent income coming in. Someone to support and to figure. And he continues going down a lifestyle. Because this is just what he's been caught up into. To me, that's selfish. And to me, that is not someone you should be loyal to. After they've proven that they didn't give a fuck about the consequences of the lifestyle they were leading it up to that point. And they had a chance to get out of it when their life got real and they had a family they had to take care of. To me, you know, it's this weird thing, like, and I'm, I'm going to say dudes, like, for some reason, us guys, we feel like we deserve this undeniable quest of loyalty no matter what. Because when El Chapo's wife is literally there trying to bail him out every chance she gets, she is committed she was, she's so far in. She's a real one, as the fellas would like to say. She's a real one. I want someone to ride or die for me like that. It's like, one, um, are you bringing that much fucking income? <laughs> Dude's bringing trillions of dollars in. You know what? When you bring trillions of dollars, your wife might try to dig you out too and uh, bring you home. But reality is, you're not bringing trillions. You're not. And that's okay. And also, there's also kind of like a reality of what the fuck is she probably going to do if he doesn't make it out, if he doesn't alive, because she don't want him to get Epstein in jail. Like, the reality is you deserve the amount of loyalty that you have presented if you constantly put your family in bad situations and... It's being neglectful at a certain point. No one should just stay with you just to stay with you. If they do, that's loyalty. But, you know, putting putting people in compromising positions through a lifetime or through periods of time just because you hold on to the idea of loyalty and you don't really exhibit the behavior that deserves that type of loyalty in return... To me, that is just kind of nonsense. And it's a lack of self-awareness that... And people want to fall back on that stuff. I'm, I wouldn't want to marry someone that's not loyal. Because I'm 
God, I sound like an asshole. I'm a loyal individual. But, you know, there comes a point where when is your loyalty just being used for prop, right? Like, when are you being embarrassed for your loyalty? Like, if you find out, like Amber Rose, right? Which, ironically, I don't think she's really in a position to ask for sympathy because she finds out her boyfriend has cheated on her with 12 different girls. When if you look at her uh, history, it's not exactly someone that I would call loyal. Um, But it's this weird thing of, okay, you know now. So leave. As far as I'm aware, they're probably working it out. Look, man, I don't know what to tell you. I can maybe understand someone cheats on you with one or two different people. And you know what? There's still a loyalty aspect you can hold on to. Which, unless it doesn't matter to you. like. But obviously, it wouldn't. Obviously, it does matter to her. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been sad about it or complained about it publicly. And, you know, 12, like, at that point, they, they really just don't give a fuck about it. Like, look, it is what it is. It, it hurts. I'm not trying to be inconsiderate. It sucks to be cheated on. But at that point, like, you can't even be mad at that. Like, that's beyond just someone making a mistake or something. That's just, yeah, they're just saying, I don't give a fuck about what you think. You either leave or go. And the reality is, they know you're going to stay. And because, you know why? Because you always brag about how loyal you are. Never brag, one thing is never actually, in my opinion, you should never brag about how loyal you are. Because if you want to talk about being vulnerable and being eaten by the wolves, oh, we're going to eat you alive. And all I'm saying is, I think loyalty, the, the, Real loyalty isn't overrated, but the loyalty that people portray of what loyalty looks like is complete horseshit, and it's complete, that's how you fuck up your life. That's how you completely look past the obvious, because you are loyal. God, I hate that, I feel like I'm, it's kind of like the Drake featuring, I know it's actually Party Next Door featuring Drake, but every song sounds like Drake featuring Drake, unless you, uh. Come and see me for once. Before you always meant to be. It's one of the songs I haven't heard in a while, but I literally just like the second I think of that, the title, I just remember. Come and see me for once. Come and see me for once. You ain't never. Know. Why you got star, girl? Why you got star? I know you got another brother. He doesn't say brother, but you know. Gotta play it safe in these streets. Cause you know, you know I just spray it. You know, I just spray that word in private. I'm joking. I literally never say the word, but whatever. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't even know why I went down that rabbit hole. Hippity hoppity Easter's on the clock. Um Yeah, man, and I I think loyal like one thing is the idea just the idea of unconditional love is also kind of bullshit to me not again not the actual what unconditional love in my opinion should look like but this irrational no matter what you will love me no matter what that honestly that's that's how you get your ass beat like that, that's how you have these domestic well oh look i'm not even gonna make fun it's not that's obviously not directly why domestic abuse happens but that's when you have people that stay with people that beat them up. Women that are with domestic abusers. You know, you have the trauma bonding, Stockholm and all that shit. And you're almost more afraid to leave. But it's also this weird, oh, it's this unconditional love. You can't break us. Even though he's broken your orbital bone a few times. But you can't break us apart. We're like a wishbone. And uh, you're definitely getting the short end of that wishbone. Um and look, I'm not, I know I'm like kind of making light of abuse. I'm obviously not, but that's kind of the point. It's this unconditional, no matter what love it's like, no, even the, even it's funny when people describe unconditional love, right? It's, we just love each other for each other. It's like, okay, 
it's so what would the it's like well you know as long as they don't cheat on me it's like well technically by definition that's not unconditional you will love them no matter what they do no matter what tribulations they put you through thick and thin and i really think marriage the weird part is People talk about marriage being outdated. I know I'm going all over the place here. I didn't know I was going to talk about this episode, but hey, look, we're going down the road. Um, it's funny on marriage that people always call marriage outdated. People say it's an old construct. It was used for this, blah, blah, blah. It's not supposed monogamy is not realistic and all this stuff. It's like, well, monogamy is not realistic if you definitely don't want to apply it, and that's fine. But don't blame an actual religion or don't blame an actual uh union of love for a reason why you don't want to be monogamous because it is a choice um like anything in life it's a choice you know all the temptations in the world like doesn't make you quote unquote go outside of the marriage like it's a choice and there's typically a list that gets there but when people say marriage is outdated, it's a social construct. And just the idea of, yes, if you want to talk about it becoming a contract and all this shit, yes. I will say this, though. I think the reality is some people need to be married to have that reminder and construct that you need to learn how to work through shit. And sometimes marriage, it shouldn't take you to get married to work through that. There should be, you should probably have some life experience to learn how to work through shit before you decide to dedicate your whole life to someone. But my opinion, I think marriage kind of forces you to look at yourself, the worst parts of yourself, uh, the parts of yourself that are hurting the home, even if it's not even on purpose. It's a real self-awareness check, right? And it's, that's why people say it's, it, marriage is an everyday job, right? That's why people say marriage is stressful. It's not because, yes, people change and shit like that, but marriage is stressful because it becomes a self-reflection on you. Because someone is going to be there to remind yourself, for better or worse, of how much of it, how much shit you carry. Like, how much baggage you have, if you haven't dealt with that beforehand. And through the thickness and thin, and people joke about it, and marriage has become more of a destination, more than an actual... Uh, Acquidation, meaning it's become more of a destination for success in, with people more than it is actually people have actually done the right steps and acquired the right traits and have actually acquired aspects of themselves to be marriage material, end quote. And I'm not here to define what's marriage material, but you can definitely tell that there's just people getting married just to get married and they don't think about the ramifications of if it doesn't work out. You don't go into marriage ready to get divorced, but you can't just go in uh, blindly, kind of like blind loyalty. You can't just go in and think, we're never getting divorced. They would never do me like this. Because you know why? People change. And marriage forces you to work on yourself. Marriage forces you to work with someone. Marriage forces you um, in a legal sense, and even though should marriage be a legal contract, not in the sense that divorces and courts and lawyers and shit, but the reality is the reason why the law has to get involved with marriage is simply because if you just left it up to people individually to make sure they do the right things and do right by someone, and um, marriage would be a complete shit show. And you would have people, and sometimes it's also created this where people feel too safe in marriages where they can do whatever and no real consequences legally. And that's when you get all this fucked up divorces, this you bought a house for you guys and then five years later she's getting there banged by the pool boy. And she's living there and you have to stay at a hotel when you're a millionaire. So that's where the lawyership, but the reality is it's like, it's almost like if you didn't have lawyers involved to protect kind of everyone involved to even out the scales at the same time, you could probably also have a complete opposite where you could have the breadwinner or dudes just essentially holding women hostage in a sense. And 
again, you should probably not marry someone that has those qualities that they may hold you hostage and always hold the fact that they provide for you, even though that's kind of their responsibility and duties they took when they took your hand of marriage is to lead you. And some dudes want to have pats on the back for doing what they're fucking supposed to do. Um, but yeah, so the average uneducated person on this topic would typically say marriage shouldn't be a contract. And although I agree that the ramifications of divorce shouldn't be as vital as they are, because there should be more common sense put into the thought process of divorce filings and, uh, you know, spousal support, if there even should be any, but especially child support, because the reality is If there was no protection of the child or even the spouse in any capacity, you would have dudes out here who would have their wife and kids and then say, well, if you leave me, your kids get nothing and you have nothing to support your kid. So even though I've created this environment where I'm the man of the house and I make all the money and all this shit, which is something that you want to do so you can feel more empowered, fine. But now that you're getting divorced, um, your kids got to live somewhere. Your kids got to find a way to live both places. And you don't want to live with her. Well, you don't want your kids seeing your wife. You know, depending on why you got divorced. And I'm not saying you're caping for when people fuck up their own marriages by self-inflicted shit. That could have been prevented. But, you know, at the end of the day, unfortunately, that is more the real reason why it has to be legal. Because otherwise, there would be a lot of people, a lot of kids fucked over by marriage. There would be um, a lot of even good wives that have been there, right? And I know it's few and far in between because we only see the really bad cases. And I'm not advocating that women should get, like, we make jokes a lot. I make jokes about all the time, like, 50%, come on. Like, everyone acknowledges that getting half of my shit would be ridiculous, but, like, to sit there and not at least have a plan to, have someone who's been a housewife and has been taking care of the house and, you know, has been a good wife, maybe for the most part, we're just going to be optimistic here because sometimes it's not the case. And you guys just get divorced for whatever reasons. Like, you're going to sit here and just throw her out into the street with your child. You know, that's not a good look for your child to see. Like, why is dad thriving and stuff, but you just let mom be broke and poor and struggling like this, you know? And so in that aspect, the courts are pretty necessary in that aspect. The problem is now is that there's just this heavy, like anything, there's this heavy overcorrection. Like to me, there should just be more common sense laws. And I don't know what that looks like, but look, I I feel like it's an easy fix. It's common sense, right? Like, it makes no sense that someone needs 10000 even on the lower end, $10,000 a month for spousal support. Like, really, $10,000 for what? Let's say you even get a house. Mortgages on the high end, $1,500, $2,000 a month, right? Okay. And you got food and stuff for your kid. You know, maybe the first couple months because you have to get furniture and shit. Fine. But... The issue is you should get like spousal support for like a a year or two, depending on the situation at most. Getting spousal support for the rest of your life. That's basically a stimulus check, but instead of coming from the government shit where they could take out your taxes and shit, it's literally just coming out of someone else's check income. To me, that's where it gets like, instead of it being for the rest of your life or until you get married... Because then, why would someone ever get married again unless they're going to marry some billionaire and then create the new cycle of game? Hashtag Brittany Renner. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for what the idea of marriage is supposed to be. And now that marriage has become more of a contract and has become more legal than anything, Marriage at the same time, they could fuck you up legally. It can also protect you in a lot of aspects. That's also the things people don't talk about marriage-wise. Um, 
And for people to say, oh, marriage is pushed and pushed, you know what? There's a lot of things that are pushed on us. At the end of the day, you got to make a decision for yourself. No one can force you to get married unless you, like, you know, live in India or something. And, like, they just arrange the marriages. Whether you walk down the aisle or not, hey, it's legal. We're going to sign it off for you, buddy. But, like, no one can, that's the thing. People can't make you do anything you don't want to do. And to feel like you got peer pressure to do things, that's a self-reflection on you just, don't have enough courage to say no if you weren't ready for that, you know? And again, the end day, that's still a you problem. Um, we want to live in a country where we have self-decisions, where we make our own decisions, and we get all the glory from decisions we make when we brag about the choices we make when it works out for us. But then when we make bad choices and it doesn't work out for us, it's always this... It's always an everyone else thing. It's always this peer pressure from society... It's always, you know, oh, you know, uh, because I felt so, like, I saw everyone else starting to have kids and get married, so, you know, I did it, and then it fucked, like, yeah, you know what, um, peer pressure is something you learn from a young age, and the fact of the matter is, most people fell into peer pressure, and then when they get older, they blame peers, pressure, even if they're not directly pressuring to do some crack, it's this constant, you start feeling pressured because you're always going to, it's like comparison is the thief of joy. That's a quote that's been said a lot lately in a lot of things. And it can't be because you're always going to compare yourself to people that are your age range or people that are in your field, people that are on the similar level of life than you. And you want to, you're trying to keep up, or at least you're just trying not to fall so far behind where you're afraid that you're perceived in a certain light negatively, you know? It's like everyone, look, regardless of what Joe Bunn's title of his recent episode was in the segment, everyone, look, the art of not caring is literally not even talking about stuff you don't care about. If you have to talk about how much you don't care about something, there's obviously an aspect you care about it. And honestly, it's okay to care about shit. It's actually good to care about shit. You know, I honestly, I wish I cared more about shit. You know, a lot of... A lot of people want to, I know I use general terms like a lot of people this and that, you know, it's just the things I see. It's what my algorithm shows me for my YouTube and stuff. So when I say a lot of people, I just mean my algorithm. I'll go, Clint's got rhythm as I'm swiveling my gyrating hips with no thrust and power because I've lost my glutinous maximus strength. But yeah, loyalty and marriage don't always go hand in hand. It should, but unfortunately it doesn't. Um, I forgot what truck. Anyways, let me uh, distract you with our sponsor for today. Ghost. Redberry Ghost. I'm planning on recording two pods tonight to get ahead of the curb. As I'm recording this, recording this on a Saturday, technically now Sunday, I have 45 episodes out now. That means I have, after this one, I'll have four in the can to put out periodically. I kind of like being behind. I kind of like being ahead, having a few ahead of time. But then at the same time, I kind of like recording, putting out that day and feeling that excitement. But, you know, it's nice to have a little comfort so I don't have to force myself to do it when I want to do it. Anyways, but yeah. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. As a Kendrick. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. It's a... Oh, yeah. As much as marriage can quote-unquote fuck up your life, and this has come from a person who's never been married, um, never even, probably really been that close. And, you know, it's... I, I just hate seeing the bad rap that marriage gets. It's like, no, the way, what people are seeing is people are seeing... The worst parts of marriage when people don't respect the other person in the marriage. Because they have this ideology of what a marriage should look like. So they find the qualities of what are quote unquote marriage material. Instead of finding someone that is right for them. Because this is who you're going to quote unquote spend the rest of your life with. People find the qualities are quote unquote marriage material. But the reality is a lot of people... What their construct of what marriage material has a negative perception that it is boring individuals. Like as a dude, 
they'll say, oh, we want a wife that's well-mannered, this, never talk, all this shit, you know, the, and although there are marriage qualities that typically work better than not, typically if you were just to get someone that, you know, never argues with you and never questions you and never holds you accountable, never, you know, they just want basically someone to tell them how great they are and come home to a comfortable home. And, but the reality is life is not always that comfortable. But there should be a balance to that, as always. But the point I'm trying to make is that then they get a wife that's exactly what they think a marriage wife, a wife that, you know, a girl that is wifey material. Then they get married to them and they're not happy because, oh, you know, they're not spon- they're not spontaneous. They're not this, they're not that. It's like... So then that's when they go cheat with the girl that's a whore. And, well, do any position you like. And maybe your wife's a two and a half position at max. She's not a very versatile individual, but she loves you. And she would do anything for you. But this girl, she will literally do anything for you. In any sexual capacity you like. And it works for the opposite. It works for a woman that get married to a dude that's... You know, he's stable, nice job. You know, he's very well-balanced-minded. You know, he's always trying to be a problem-solution. Never raises his voice. He's always calm. But, mm, he's not that funny. He's not that fun to go to dinner with. He's not someone you like being around a whole lot, but you like him. And then, you end up being miserable... Then you realize there's all their qualities that you would kind of like that you're afraid to admit. You like a guy with an edge. You like a guy that, you know, likes to drink real alcohol. You like a guy that, you know, likes to just fuck and not make love. And the reality is, is that people write to like what they like. But the issue is, is that people... They marry wrong the first time because they didn't think through it, what they actually wanted. And then they have this warped negative perception, and then they pass it on to everyone else of how terrible marriage is. Like, no, your marriage was terrible because you had no game plan. You had no organization of what you liked. You didn't even know what you liked. You were afraid to acknowledge what the qualities you didn't like, and you could have prevented a whole marriage and not waste each other's time. But you had this idea to not think for yourself, but you want to think for yourself until you, you know, have to think for yourself. And so many of bad marriages, in my opinion, can be prevented. And I know that sounds, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, people change over time. And of course, there's going to be shit that happens. Your people are going to find out people, you know, uh, what they want in life could be different at 28 than 37. Like, that is a reality thing. And then you have that midlife crisis, and you wonder, is this a person I can get out of this with? Is this a person I want to actually live with? It's like, well, we already got a house, you know, this and that. And then you may stay for the wrong reasons. But you know what? You made that bed for yourself. And I'm not here to shit on people who have terrible first marriages. Like, nah, you know what? There's people that marry seven times, which I think... Look, I think like after a second or third time, um, there's there's a reason why law is involved. Because when people just be out here fucking up each other's lives, just getting married left and right, and not treating it serious. And when the court's involved, maybe you'll take your marriage seriously. And the unfortunate reality is, it's sad if you have to rely on a court of law for you to take your marriage seriously, you probably shouldn't be married, or at least be married to the person that you don't take serious. I know, crazy shit here. Breaking news. Um... You know, look, I'm going to wrap up the marriage talk because I feel like I'm talking way too long for someone who's not married. And I do want to be married. also want to be married and have kids around the same time. I don't necessarily think, look, preferably, like, obviously, you would want to be married before you have kids because that would typically signify that you have found a partner and a life partner that you are going to live with, someone you enjoy. And someone that you actually share a commonality, you have similar beliefs, 
typically religious beliefs, typically similar experiences and how you want to raise your kids. You probably have those talks before you get, before you have kids. And you have someone that you, you are willing to go through all the struggles that had come with having kids and, but you found someone that you are, that you trust, someone that you trust to raise a family with. And, but I don't think you necessarily, but you know, I definitely wouldn't want to just have kids just to have kids, right? Like, I know I was like, I, I wouldn't want to go the Nick Cannon model or future model where you just have a bunch of kids and they don't see like a true bonding experience with me and the girl I have kids with. Like, you know, there may be an inevitable reality where we're not the same eight, ten years later, but whatever. But like, I would, I wouldn't want my kid. I wouldn't want to have kids. Like, I think to me, I would rather not have kids if I'm not able to find someone, a partner that I have kids with. Because I think at the end of the day, it's doing a disservice to the child. I know. Oh, look at Clint being considerate for the youth. And, you know, it's a... To me, you know, I, I it would have nothing to do. Obviously, I would want to, you know, I would want to have... X amount of money, have, you know, a stable financial environment, all that shit, all that good shit. But more importantly, I would want to be able to actually, you know, make it immediate, hands-on, feasible impact beyond just what I can buy and what I can do and what I can provide. Because to me, as a man, providing is really just the minimum requirements and the issue when you watch a lot of these court shows when it comes to kids and stuff, people like, dudes like want like pats on the back for providing for their child. And it's like, I I only have questions if you don't provide for your child. Um, you know, I think, you know, you should be honored on day, you know, Father's Day and shit like that. Like, but the reality is from the outside, no one, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You know, and the fact that dudes even have that mentality that just just providing for the kids is all it is, right? And this isn't exclusive just to guys, but, you know, as a dude, you know, I'm just going to focus on the dude side. Like when I see dudes, like, you know, talk about how much they, oh, we do this and this, it's like, yeah, you're supposed to. And the fact that it's probably like a microcosm that, this braggadocious aspect that us men have where it's more of just we want to what's the word choice i know i'm stumbling through this i know what i mean but i want to make sure i word it correctly uh people just want all the gratification in the world for doing what they're supposed to do and i think it's like drake's line Men talk more than bitches these days. Let that sink in. Men talk more than bitches these days. Who can get pussy quicker these days? You know, whatever. Typical Drake line. But, you know, we live in this cult. Like, could you imagine? Like, I want you, like, if you're my age, right? Even if you're like there, could you imagine your dad just going around talking about how great of a dad he is or how much he like just goes around bragging about, Hey, I provide, I do this. It's like, yeah, you're supposed to like kids didn't ask to be in this world, but you brought them in. Like it's more of a travesty. If you don't, if you do great, did you, I I just want you to visualize like, and now I think when you have like dudes, my age, their fathers, you see a lot of Snapchat. It's just them posting videos and shit or Instagram, just them posting them spending time with their kid. Like, cool. Um, But when I could tell, like, people are doing it because they want this approval outside. This is where I'm going for. Yeah, this is the point I was trying to make. When people are trying to go outside the numbers, people are trying to go outside of the people that matter for confirmation or validation 
of how great of a father because they just want comments on there be like, oh, it's so cute. You're such a great father. It's like, yeah, like you were feeding him Gerber uh, apple pear sauce. Um, you know, a baby could literally feed another baby that. Um, it, it, it's just this, I really think it's a, t it's a very concerning validation, in my opinion, as, as a dude, to go seek validation for doing things that should be wired in you, the one to do, that should honestly not fucking matter if people validate it or not. And, you know, that's just a concerning thing to me. And I think it all, it all ties in together. It all ties into the marriage construct. It all ties into when people say marriage is outdated. No, I think the reality is, is that, um, the type of dudes that have grown up and now they're having kids, when you realize of how they were raised in the society we live in and that you're rewarded for post for doing standard stuff, like, could you imagine if your mom was somehow like in a newspaper or on TV for like, they did a whole story because she breastfeeds her kids. It's like, yeah, every mother breastfeeds her kids. Like, could you imagine like if every time like you do the things you're supposed to do, you know, the basic everything. Hey, I, uh, I took my kid to get ice cream. I really showed him that I like spending time with him. It's like, okay. Like, it's this constant of, no pun intended, of, like, you know, ice cream combos. <laughs> it's, you know, and unfortunately, it's it's this weird thing. And it's like I said before, like, people that have kids, they make it like they want to make you feel like you are completely inept in talking about these situations. When, honestly, there's a lot of people that have kids that, honestly, are inept in talking about having kids. Because you hear, like, some people, like, the most concerning part, especially in this, uh, like, the Brittany Renner situation, she's posting pictures of her child with her through all this drama and stuff with her uh, child's father. Whatever their personal situation is irrelevant. It's the fact that she could care less because she's probably making money off those Instagram posts. And... It's like uh, when that YouTube family tried to adopt a child from, I believe it was Ethiopia. They tried to adopt a black child and they were a white couple. And then when they found out through the adoption, so it seems like, oh, it's this cute little story. And all of a sudden during the adoption process, um, the adoption agency literally told them, hey, um, you can't. It's like, all right. Uh, one of the rules is when you adopt a child, you can't post them on social media for, I think it was like two or three years, but they literally, they're a YouTuber. They make money off Instagram and social media, but you would think if someone's pure intentions, who fucking cares? We can't, we want to raise this child and adopt. We just want to, you know, love this child and bring it a home, right? Because that's why people always adopt It's for the right reasons. And then to find out when they decided, you know what, we don't want to adopt. And on top to add insult to injury, right, obviously the kid is a baby, he's a little kid, so he didn't even, probably didn't even meet the family yet or nothing, so he's not attached to the family or nothing. But the fact that as a kid, the reason why you weren't adopted is because they can't post you on social media for two or three years, which goes inside the mind of the people that are quote unquote adopting because they just love and they want to adopt this child. Is that they were going to probably adopt the child to literally use it as a not a sympathetic tool, but as a heartwarming storyline for their social media where they make money off. And they would have literally propped a child. They literally would have used a child as a fucking prop. Like it was a puppet. Like it was Jeff Dunham's like Ahmed the Terrorist. And they were literally going to use this child for social media purposes to make fucking money. 
like I have feelings about people that use their kids as a driving force for money on YouTube in general. But you know what? It's if it's your own kid and like, hey, this is how we make money. He plays games, and that's my son, that's my daughter, fine. But when you adopt a child as a specific reason, because essentially the way it looks is you're gonna use that child to make you money and you only adopted it because you know that people would have this extra heartwarming heart to you and you would probably get a lot of extra viewers from the black community because you're taking care of a black child on top of that it really comes off it's not even come off let's just call it what it is sometimes you don't i don't need to hear the situation and all this no and then on the biggest thing is they made a video explaining fake crying in front of a camera. The dude looked like fucking uh, Professor X, the newer version. And he looked like a fucking bitch. Sitting there, it was so hard. It's like, it was not hard. You didn't give a fuck about that child. You were going to use that child for fucking money. And if I was a subscriber to that channel, seeing that shit, there would be no way I would justify I would never watch the shit again. I would unsubscribe. And I would, and I never click the down, the dislike button on any video. If I just don't like it, I just don't like it, and I move forward. Um, but I would actually click the dislike button on that. And then I would, I wouldn't even comment, because I'm not one of those saying you're a piece of shit. But I'll just say they're pieces of shit. Um, because they don't give a fuck about the child like that. They were, because what probably would have happened is once the child got older, probably like six to seven, or like six to seven years down the road, they may have... Realize it was really hard decision for us is like if you really want to adopt a child and the child is right there and you're literally like a month away from you officially having this child it's not a hard decision if you really want a child you don't just change your mind like that if you really quote unquote wanted a child because you just wanted a child and wanted to bring a child into your life and give it a home or serve some internal purpose to yourself like you literally you and that's why the adoption agencies have these fucking rules and regulations. It's for people like you to not use these children. For anything other than providing a home and being parents to them. Honestly, oh man, that shit pisses me off. But it's just that mentality. And I believe they were like early 30s. They may have been late 20s. Like they were not too far from my age range. But the fact that people have the mentality and don't even like draw the line, like there's no common sense, there's no lawn line drawn. I kept saying lawn drying. <laughs> there's no line drawn in the sand when wrong is wrong, right is right, that most people would agree on. Because regardless of what people think, yeah, you know, there's com no, there's a universal acceptance of certain things of what's right and what's wrong. I understand there's nuance. Um, I think adopting a child from a third world country that comes from nothing and then adopting them to you and then using them just as a prop and for money and not actually use, not actually providing them the home they need and they just feel like they're being used. Like, kids aren't idiots. They know that. They know when they're being used, especially when they get older and realize, wow, you made millions of dollars off of me. Sack of shit. But yeah. Moral of today's episode. Um, marriage has a great purpose. Sometimes the law is involved. But unfortunately it's a necessary evil. But it's just an overcorrection of what's going on. Maybe common sense should be placed. Same way adoption agencies see common sense. Like yeah. Don't adopt one of these children. And use them for fucking social media. To gain money. Go fuck yourself. It wasn't that they couldn't. Do YouTube? It's like, yeah, no, you just can't have the kid in your videos and exploit children. Crazy thought. Wow. Don't exploit children. How dare you tell us now how not to exploit our child? It's like, well, you know, we can. Because we're the reason why you'll even have a child or not, you sack of shit. Um, but yeah. All right. Pretty uh, heavy episode today. Even though I talked well. Got through it. Your boy's killing it. Uh, the analytics for the audio of the podcast is doing great. The views, let's get them up, guys. Let's get them up. All right, guys. Uh, subscribe and like the vid. Um, remember the give your girl a feet rub. 
and uh, suck some titties and uh, spank that ass, shake that ass, and uh, let her know you want her to wear spanks around her ass. Magical Blaze. Do you know her name? Cause I know she wants me to say hey and text hey. What you doing later? Nothing. I'm gonna shut the fuck up. Alright guys, have a great day whenever this is posted. And remember, don't exploit your fucking children. You sacks of shit. You know why I turned the audio off, but this is just for the camera. For, to that couple, go fuck yourself. Because that child, all it wants, all that child wanted was a home, not to be exploited. And thank God that there's actually these precautions. Because you know what? Not every home, just because you have a furnished home, just because you have a little money, is not a good environment for the child. That child would be better living with some, you know, girl who's barely making it by and working at some, you know, grocery store and making 1500 a month and... 900 goes the rent and then 300 the bills a child would be better off with her because you know what she has a good heart and she's not going to use that child in the meantime go fuck yourself